Thank you, Mark, and good morning. If you were here last week, you know we finished the book of First Thessalonians, and so we're going to go to the Old Testament for about six weeks and do a study on the prophet Elijah. And we'll begin with the chapter where he is introduced to us, 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I'm going to read the first 16 verses, and then uh, we'll have a word of prayer. 1 Kings 17. Now Elijah the Tishpite was one of the settlers of Gilead and said, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. It shall be that you will drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Then Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go, do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake from it first, and bring it out to me, and afterward you may make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah." May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7, the Apostle Paul gives a brief summary of the Christian life. He wrote, We walk by faith, not by sight. We trust God's Word and follow it. That's the Christian life. It's a challenging life because sometimes circumstances seem to be obstacles that are too great to overcome. And we wonder, is faith reasonable? Can God provide? Israel faced that challenge within days after they left Egypt. Getting beyond the Red Sea with Pharaoh's chariots at their backs, finding water in the desert, being fed in the wilderness. They doubted God's ability and His care for them, but the Lord always proved able and faithful. And we have many such examples in the Word of God 
to support our confidence in Him. Some of the greatest examples in the Bible of God's power and provision are uh, recounted in the life and times of Elijah the Tishbite, God's prophet who believed the Lord and found Him faithful. When Elijah first appears in the Bible, it could be said in the words of Dickens, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Solomon's kingdom had divided between north and south. There was hostility between the two. In the northern kingdom especially, there was chaos. One king after another was overthrown. Then Omri seized the throne. He established stability in the north peace with Judah in the south, and made trade agreements with the Phoenicians to the west, it began an age of peace and prosperity. It was at this time that they built great houses and the ivory palaces mentioned in Amos chapter 3 and verse 15. It was the best of times, but it came at a cost. Omri made a deal with the devil when he arranged a political marriage between his son Ahab and the Phoenician daughter of the king of Sidon, Jezebel. Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal, and she was a true believer. She propagated paganism throughout the kingdom of Israel and persecuted God's prophets. It was the worst of times. But as someone said... It is always darkest just before the day dawneth. And 1 Kings 17 begins with the first ray of light. Now Elijah the Tishbite was one of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew, nor rain these years except by my word. Elijah, who would become the great prophet to the Jewish people, the standard for prophets, appears on the scene suddenly without warning or introduction. And very little is known about him. He was from Gilead, which was the region on the east side of the Jordan River where the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh were located. We know how he dressed from 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 8. Other than that, we know very little about him. We know from the account in 1 Kings and from James chapter 5 and verse 17 that he was a man of prayer and a man like us with human weaknesses, uh, a man with a nature like ours, as James said. In other words, Elijah was a great man, as we will see, a bold man, a man of faith, but no superhero of fiction. And that's important. Elijah is a man that we can identify with and we can learn from. And what we learn from him is the necessity of living by faith, not by sight. Looking to the Lord in prayer and acting in obedience. It is not Elijah who is great, but the God of Elijah. And Elijah declared that wherever he went and his name was said, because his name means, my God is Yahweh, which is to say, Yahweh is God. And that's the lesson of this book. The Lord is God. He is real. He is relevant. He is personal. He cares about His people. We are to believe that. We are to trust in Him in these days in which we live, which spiritually in many ways are very dark days. We're to trust Him and know that He will provide for us in every situation. Elijah's life is proof of that, and his name is the message of that. When Baal worship was in its ascendancy, at its peak, filling the nation of Israel with its priests and altars, this man suddenly appeared and told King Ahab, the Lord is God, not Baal. 
And his prophecy that there would be neither dew nor rain was a direct challenge to Baal and proof that he was not real, but just a false idea. Baal was the storm god. He was the god of rain. And in an agrarian and pastoral nation like Israel, a land of farms and flocks, rain was essential, as really rain is everywhere. And so in the midst of great prosperity and peace, the Lord declared through His prophet, rain will cease and prosperity will stop. If the storm God could not create rain, He wasn't real. And the land would be dry until the prophet spoke and reversed it. That was Elijah's message to the king. And what a bold message it was. Think of the contrast that we have here. This rustic from the country, wearing a hairy garment and leather belt, standing before the king of Israel, declaring, I'm going to shut up the heavens. And then he was gone. As suddenly as he appeared, he disappeared. The word of the Lord came to him saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. He was sent away for his protection to remove him from Ahab's reach, but also for his instruction. He was a man of God, a man of faith. He stood before the Lord, he said. He spoke for the Lord. But no man or woman of God is so mature that he or she doesn't need to learn more about the Lord. The Lord God is infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and we need to learn who He is. We can never come to the end of it. I think I've said this many times. Heaven and the world to come, the new heavens and the new earth, which are eternal, will be a time of learning and learning and will never come to the end of the knowledge of God for all eternity. Never. And so we're never in a, point, a place where we don't need to learn about the Lord. And Elijah would be given important lessons by the river Cherith or the, the stream Cherith. And there he would be strengthened in his faith and, and prepared further for the mission that God had given to him. God would protect the prophet and provide for him every day in A miraculous way. He would drink from the brook and every morning and evening ravens would bring him bread and meat. Stand before the Lord. Represent Him. Speak His Word. At home. At the office. At school. Wherever He has placed you. And He will take care of you. He's no man's debtor. He does not abandon His servants. He provides and has unlimited means and ways of doing it. Now that's the Lord God. That's our God. That's the God of Elijah. But it's a God that the world can't imagine. Now it can imagine a God that rules generally, that's kind of out there, and we have a sense of what He is or who He is. He's concerned about the big things, not the small things, not the details of life. He's not personally involved with us. That's the God of the world, but it's not the God of the Bible. The Lord God is sovereign over all things. It is all His creation. He controls all of the elements and nature, and He makes even the ravens His servants to provide for His prophet. In spite of the circumstances, Elijah trusted in the word of the Lord. He believed the Lord and obeyed. And the Lord provided for him in an amazing, miraculous way. He's good for his word. One of the older writers, F.W. Krumacher, said, Faith is the grave of care. I like that statement. Faith is the grave of care. It is. If God promised it, He will do it. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Rest in that. 
Elijah did. Now, Elijah is a man like all of us, James said, with a nature like us, and he'll have his struggles as well, as we will see. But he trusted in the Lord. He rested in his command and his instruction, and the Lord provided for him. It was, I think, a respite for Elijah, a time of rest and reflection, of of thinking on the Lord and His ways, of fellowship with Him. And it continued until the drought dried up the brook. And now Elijah faced a new test. Did he become concerned as he watched this stream shrink and wonder, well... What now? Do I, do I need to take things in hand and, and make provision for myself? Should I move on? Well, if those thoughts went through his mind, it's not said here in the Scripture. Nevertheless, Elijah would learn more about the Lord and His ways through this situation and this challenge that he was now facing. And one thing that he would learn is he was not to depend upon present blessings. They may end. And that applies to us. God is always faithful to provide. His provisions are good. They're always right. But we can become dependent on them and think more of the provision than we do of the provider. And sometimes God removes that, and He removes it for our good. Think of October 29, 1929, Black Tuesday, or... Since none of us were there at that time, think of something more recent like 2008 and what happened to your IRA or your 401k and how suddenly in a moment it was reduced to half or less. Uh, You have a, a steady stream in your life. You've come to expect it and depend upon it. Depend upon it. If it dries up suddenly, if your resources are, are exhausted, is that reason to panic, to jump out a window? No. Think on God's greatness. Think on Him. Trust in Him. Believe His promise. Pray to Him. Wait on Him. Be where you should be doing what you should be doing. Don't panic. Trust the Lord. He's faithful. Elijah was being taught that lesson, not to rely on the gift, but on the giver. The provisions of life may fail us, but the Lord never does. Trust in Him. Another lesson for the prophet was the importance of waiting on the Lord. God had told him to go to the brook, and He hadn't told him to leave, so He waited. As he watched this brook disappear, he waited. That's a hard thing to do, to wait. That's a great act of faith, really. Eric Alexander has preached here more than once. It's been some time since Eric was here, but he told me about a ministry that he had in a small church in Scotland and how he had dedicated himself to seeing it developed. He made that commitment to its members. So I guess they had a kind of covenant. And he saw development. So did others. He got a call one day from a very prominent minister in a large church in London who wanted him to leave Scotland and come to London and be their preacher. It was a a great opportunity. He took it very seriously. He prayed about it. But he knew that the the work he had committed himself to in the Lord was not yet finished. So he stayed in Scotland, and God blessed. God's guidance is is sometimes mysterious. It, It is through His Word, and that is not mysterious. That's very plain. That's set out for us most in 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 most of the instances. But it's also through providence and conviction. And it takes faith to see things and wait upon the Lord to get the answer that we would like and, and to know how exactly we should go forward. That takes faith. Elijah did that. He stayed 
as the brook continued to dry up. Then the Lord spoke again to the prophet at the right time and instructed him to leave his place of comfort and move on. He said, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he commanded ravens to provide. Now he's commanded a widow to provide. Now, that's a command and that's instruction that really didn't encourage confidence. Zarephath was in a pagan land, Sidon. The land of the Phoenicians, Jezebel's land, Baal country. And a widow was going to be his means of support. Widows were the weakest and most vulnerable people in ancient society. They needed people to provide for them. But she would be Elijah's support. It was another challenge to his faith and his obedience to go to a widow But he'd been fed for months by ravens. If God could use unclean birds, he could use a pagan widow. So he went. Came out of hiding and traveled north to the land of the Phoenicians until he came to the gates of Zarephath. There he saw the widow gathering sticks for a fire for her meal. Elijah called out to her. When he did, he discovered that the drought had reduced her to her last bit of food. She was on the verge of starvation and death when he asked her for a drink and a meal. Please, bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, as the Lord your God lives... I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Well, Elijah told her not to worry. The Lord would provide. He said in verse 14, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. You'll be provided for as long as this famine goes on. The Lord's going to take care of you. Now, Baal could not do that, but the Lord could, and he did. She believed Elijah, and it happened according to the word of the Lord. She, her son, and the prophet ate for many days. Verse 16, the bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. So in Phoenicia, in the very heartland of Baal worship, the Lord had power over things Baal didn't. The Lord provided where Baal failed because Baal doesn't exist and the Lord does. But the priests of Baal had an explanation for why the storm god didn't produce a storm, didn't produce rain during certain seasons in the year when there was no rain or when droughts occurred. In the Baal myths, each year, Baal submitted to the god Mot, the god of death. And he went into the netherworld. That was the reason for dry seasons. But every year, the goddess Anat defeated Mot and freed Baal to restore the land to fertility. And that explains the seasons of the year. This happened every year, this cycle. And it would explain the drought. Why a drought? Well, Baal is dead. He's in the netherworld. But what the Lord demonstrated to the widow and to his own people is the Lord doesn't die. He cannot die. The Lord is immortal, self-existent, the only God and the supplier of all life. And he showed himself to the widow as the living God and giver of life next when she experienced the greatest tragedy of her life. 
And Elijah did the greatest miracle in the chapter. Verse 17, now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Just when it seemed that they had had come through this great trial, this famine, when it seemed as though they were going to make it through this terrible time and survive it all, her son suddenly died. The widow was devastated. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. The sudden reversal of fortune left her completely disillusioned with the prophet and with the Lord. It now seemed that the whole thing was a a, a conspiracy against her for a sin she had committed. Maybe it's an, an unknown, undeclared sin, something that she'd kept within and she had been haunted about for years And she felt that now justice had finally caught up with her and taken her only son. Or maybe she just had this general sense of guilt. She knew that she was wrong with the Lord and something was not right with her life, that she's guilty. But she thought that it was punishment, which fit a notion that is very common, I think, and that is that God is a hard and merciless God. That's how we we, we often think. We may not actually think it in those words, but we have this sense that God is going to get us. When tragedy occurs due to sin, and and when it occurs, we think it's due to some sin or guilt. And I think that's a common thought because we see that very clearly in John chapter 9. You remember when the disciples are walking with the Lord in Jerusalem and they see this man He must have been a famous beggar to them because they knew his condition, that he was blind from birth. And so they asked the question if his condition was due to his sin or his parents' sin. They didn't ask, is it due to sin? They just assumed, of course, this is due to sin, but whose sin? His? Well, how could it be his since he's blind from birth? Then was it his parents' sin? This was a problem they had. Can you solve this problem? And Jesus answered, neither. Neither one. But it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And then you know the story, how he healed the blind man. And it was an amazing miracle. And and that man became a great witness for the Lord to the leaders of Jerusalem. It was for the glory of God. And that would be the outcome of this incident. But the widow didn't know that, and neither did the prophet. They couldn't see into the future, or the prophet couldn't at this point. God had not revealed that to him. And so he's put to the test again, really. And the prophet's disturbed by this tragedy just as much, it seems, as the widow was. Still, he knew the Lord. He knew God's power, that nothing is too difficult for the Lord, as the Lord told Abraham in Genesis 18, verse 14. You're going to have a son, Abraham. It's hard to believe. How can someone my age have a son? And the Lord says, is anything too difficult for the Lord? That's an interesting statement because the word difficulty, that Hebrew word also means wonderful. Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? I mean, I can't do the most wonderful things for you. That's how great God is. Well, Elijah knew the Lord. He knew He is merciful, so he did what he should do and what we should do. He went to the Lord. He took the dead child from his mother's arms. He carried him to his own room upstairs. He laid him on his own bed and he called out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? I think that suggests that that the prophet is puzzled and he doesn't quite understand this situation. Even to Elijah, from all appearances, the Lord repaid evil for good. Her hospitality with death. 
That didn't make sense to Elijah. It wouldn't make sense to us either. Over the, the three years, no doubt he had come to really love this family, love this child and, and care about the, the widow and was grieved for the grief that she was going through and grieved because the child was gone. That's a reminder, again, that no matter how mature a person may be in the faith or uh, he or she has grown in the, in the knowledge of the Lord God, there are still gaps in our thinking. None of us has it all together. And it, it, there are gaps in our thinking, and oftentimes there, there's a disconnect between the mind and the emotions. We don't know everything. We don't understand everything. And even when we understand things, sometimes we, we regress and we're troubled. And we need to be reminded of truth that we've come to believe. And we're always in need of instruction. That, the reason for the events in providence, the providence of God, that trouble us are events like this very event here. They, they remind us uh, of, uh, of the mystery of the relationship we have with the Lord God. Events like the death of a child, this one has a wonderful resolution, but oftentimes it's not that. We go through these experiences and we don't have the resolution. And we wonder why. Why has this happened? Well, they are the secret things of Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, that Moses said belong to the Lord. We're not going to be able to penetrate many of those things. But even though Elijah was in the dark about this and deeply troubled, he knew the Lord and had faith in Him. And he knew the Lord hears his people when they cry out to him. And so in his confusion, in his grief, Elijah did that. He cried out. We read in verses 21 through the end of the chapter, Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray you let the, child, let the child's life return to him. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Before James referenced Elijah's prayers, he wrote in James chapter 5, verse 16, the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. This miracle was not due to the prophet's power, but the Lord's power in answer to the prophet's prayer. Again, it had a message to the widow and to the people of that age that God is not like Baal. The Lord God does not die. He is immortal. He is the source of life. He gives life to the dead. Baal could do nothing like that because Baal was a myth, but a cruel myth that kept people enslaved to fear, it kept them enslaved to the fear of death. This miracle proved the Lord true and merciful. And the widow believed. Now why did God choose this widow to bless and not another? Well, we don't know. Other than it was His sovereign grace. But He did, and through His blessings, He led her to faith. And all of that, like that blind man in John chapter 9, so too here, was all to His glory. He turned tragedy into blessing. We can't see the good hidden in hardship. We just see the dark cloud. But it's as William Cooper wrote in his hymn, Behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. 
He has a good intention in everything that touches our lives. And that is the life of faith. That's trusting His Word in spite of the circumstances. That's how we live. We trust Him, even though the circumstances seem to deny what He's saying. And we can go to a text like this and know that this is the God behind the difficulties of life. He's a good and merciful God. And someday He will make those secret things known to us. And then we'll understand. Now as we look at this chapter and the way the Lord dealt with His prophet and this woman, we might wonder if, if we could just raise the dead today. J- just imagine the results of that. Just imagine how many people would believe, just like the widow of Zarephath. And wouldn't it be nice if, if we had the advantages of Elijah and God spoke audibly to us and He told us what to do each day. Go there today. Go there tomorrow. You know, that's, that's false thinking, but that is not un- an uncommon way for people to think today. I recently read a novel. It's a Japanese novel a Japanese author titled Silence. In fact, they made a movie of it a few years back. It's pretty faithful to the book. It's about a Jesuit missionary who went to Japan in the 1600s. It's actually a historical novel based somewhat on history. This uh, Jesuit went to Japan in the 1600s, and it's about the persecution that he witnessed and that he experienced. After watching some peasants slowly drowned in the sea for practicing their Catholic faith, and hearing one singing a hymn as he died, the priest wondered about the silence of God. He thought to himself, while they raise their voice, their voices in anguish, God remains with folded arms silent. He heard lots of sounds. Throughout the novel, ravens screeching, turtle doves singing, cicadas buzzing, his guards laughing, and prisoners praying, but from God, only silence. Lord, why are you silent, he asked. Why are you always silent? Have you ever felt that God is silent? Maybe during a difficult time, you've You've prayed, but not felt anything and thought, I want to hear a voice. I wish God would speak, but all I get is silence. That's false. God has spoken. He is not silent. He has spoken in His Word in the Scriptures, and in them given to us His mind and His answers. The Bible is revelation sufficient for every situation we find ourselves in life. The problem is not God's silence, but our deafness. We're not listening. And now is the time for us to listen to what He has said, to read His Word, to understand the Scriptures, to believe them, and gain the skill that we can have and that the Spirit of God can create within us to apply the Scriptures properly. That's walking by faith. But people find it hard to do. Israel did. Psalm 78 verse 19 recounts their doubts as they came out of Egypt and entered the Sinai Desert. They spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? I've been there. I've been to that desert. I understand their worry. It's like a moonscape with uh, maybe a few shrubs. How can God feed a multitude there? But He did. Every day, and their shoes never wore out. Elijah had that great event recorded in his Bible, just as we do, and it was there to encourage his faith, just as it is to encourage ours, and God did the same for him. Gave, he gave manna from, from heaven to Israel. He gave bread and meat from the sky, from the ravens to Elijah. When Jesus finished 
teaching over 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, on the far shore of Galilee, he told them to sit down. And the place was a wilderness. In fact, in Mark, it's described as a desert. That's the word that he uses. Eremos, it's a word for a desert. And I think it's described that way. It's usually described and translated a deserted place, but it's the word desert is used to make us reflect upon the desert in Sinai and the way the Lord provided for the people there. And what is being indicated is that Lord, that God, is there on the shore of Galilee. And there He fed the multitude in that desert. He broke a few loaves and fishes and He fed all of them with baskets left over. Just as that widow would pour out the little bit of oil she had and find there was still some there left for the next day, so Jesus broke bread and there was still more in His hands to fill the next basket. The bread that fed Israel in the wilderness, that fed Elijah by the brook, that fed the widow and her son in the famine is a picture of Christ. The true bread that came down out of heaven. He is God's greatest provision for mankind who gives forgiveness and everlasting life to all who believe in Him. And now, since the Father sacrificed His Son for us, He won't withhold anything from us. That's the assurance we have from Romans 8 verse 32. That since the Father gave up His own Son for us, He will freely give us all things. Since He gave the greatest for us, He will surely not withhold the least from us. Elijah experienced that as he walked by faith, not by sight. And we will experience that as we walk by faith. But we'll never walk by faith as the prophet walked if our God is small. And we will never know God as great and faithful unless we listen to Him, unless we hear Him in His Word, in the Scriptures. We need to read them. We need to know them. We need to study them. That's how we listen to God. Faith comes from hearing, Paul said, and hearing from the Word of Christ. He is not silent. He has spoken. Listen to Him. May God give all of us ears to hear and a desire to hear Him. But maybe you've never heard His voice. Maybe you have never believed in Christ as Savior. He has spoken about that. Here's what He said in Matthew 11. Come to Me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest from your sin. Rest from the weight of God guilt that is upon you, if you feel that, if you sense that, look to Christ. Trust in Him. He removed that weight at the cross for all who believe. Turn to Him. Be saved. May God help you to do that and help all of us to live for Him, to walk by faith, to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and to His glory. Well, let's end with Psalm 23, a psalm about God's guidance and provision. In the Songs of Praise book, let's stand and sing hymn number 23. Father, we are so thankful we have a shepherd who leads us daily, continually. In fact, a shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. He's the good shepherd. We thank you for him. May we live lives that honor him and please you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.